Welcome to Straight Scripture, No Sugar. This is a Bible sermon series dedicated exclusively to the Word of God. Father, sanctify them in truth. Thy word is truth. John 17, 17. John 8, 31 and 2. If you abide in me and abide in my word, truly you are my disciples and you'll know the truth and the truth shall make you free. Proverbs 35. Every word of the Lord, uh, the Lord proves true. He is a shield to those who take refuge in him. Do not add to his words lest he rebuke you and you be found a liar. Jesus himself says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody comes to the Father except through me, John 14, 6. So if you have the truth, you have the word of God, you have an absolute to build your life on as opposed to the shifting sands of the culture, the shifting sands of human opinion, the shifting hands of human wisdom, or the shifting sands rather. 1 Corinthians 3, 19, human wisdom is foolishness in God's eyes. You want the absolute truth, the irrefutable truth, the word of God to build your life on. That gives you a rock solid foundation. It's no coincidence that God is called a rock throughout scripture. Isaiah 26, four, trust in the Lord forever. For in the Lord God, you have an everlasting rock because he speaks the truth and he does not change. And that's why this series is, is devoted exclusively to the truth called Straight Scripture, No Sugar. So today's sermon topic is triune harmony. Triune harmony. Now, what am I talking about? I'm talking about the unity that exists between the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It's perfect. It's holy. It's pure. It reflects perfect agreement, perfect unity, okay, without any dissension, without any strife, without any rebellion, with perfect love, with perfect collaboration, and with perfect agreement, okay? That kind of relationship exists between Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and it begins at the very outset of the scriptures in Genesis chapter one. In fact, it's in the first verse of Genesis. We see the unity and the harmony of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. And you could say, well, why on earth can't human beings have this kind of harmony? Well, it's because of their sin. And ultimately it takes the influence, it takes the transformation of the heart through the Holy Spirit and submission to the word of God for human beings to have this kind of harmony. But it is never ever going to be the perfect harmony of God, but through the grace and spirit of God, it can reflect it and it can create relationships that are whole, that are loving, that are unified, that are collaborative and nurturing and supportive and rewarding. So without further ado, let's get into the first verse here. Okay, here we see the harmony of the Father and of the Holy Spirit at creation. And then I'm going to provide another verse which shows the son's involvement, and he is also in harmony with the Father and the Spirit. Here's the first verse from Genesis chapter 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Genesis chapter 1, verses 1 to 2. Okay, we can see God created the heavens and the earth, okay, but the Holy Spirit, he's there at creation, okay? He's there at creation, and he's moving over the waters. He's hovering over the face of the waters. So what's going on there, okay? He's essentially awaiting orders, okay? The Holy Spirit is waiting to be God's agent in creation, okay? God created the heavens and the earth, okay? And in the beginning, what do we have? We have a void, okay? We have a void, we have darkness, and we have the Holy Spirit moving over the waters, okay? The earth doesn't have any form yet, okay? Darkness is over the face of the deep, and the Holy Spirit 
is moving over the waters, okay? Nothing has been formed yet, but we see that God is the author of creation. He created the heavens and the earth, and the Holy Spirit is moving over the waters. So what happens after that? Well, first God separates the darkness from the light. He calls the light day, the darkness night. Okay, then he separates the waters, okay, into two places. There's a firmament between, there's waters above, waters beneath, and the waters beneath he brings together, okay, to form the earth. And then he causes the land to rise up. And the Holy Spirit is the agent, is the creative agent, the executor, of God's will to bring form and shape to these waters. That's why he's moving over the waters, okay? But the sun is also the primary agent of creation. We learn about that among other places in Colossians chapter one, okay? Here Paul is describing Christ, okay? He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on the earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created through him and for him, and he is before all things, and in him all things consist. Colossians 1 verses 15 to 17, okay? All things were created by him that are in heaven and on the earth, the visible and invisible, powers, rulers, principalities, everything, okay? All things were created by him, okay? So it looks like in Genesis that the Holy Spirit is executing God's orders, right? But he delegates that creative power to his son, okay? All things were made by him, uh, all, for by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on the earth, visible and invisible, okay? So they were made by Christ, but the creative agent is the Holy Spirit. So God basically delegates his creation of the heavens and the earth to the Son who creates everything through the Spirit. The Spirit is the executor of the will of the Father through the Son. So we see the Holy Spirit, the Father, and the Son working together in perfect harmony here at the creation, okay? The Father creates the heavens and the earth through the Son or by the Son, okay? And then the, the executor or the agent of creation is the Holy Spirit who moves over the waters at the very beginning of creation. So we see perfect harmony here between Father, Son, and Spirit at creation, but it goes further, okay? Here's later in Genesis, when Adam is created. Then God said, let us make man in our image, okay? Not in my image, in our image. According to our likeness, let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth, okay? Let us make man in our image, okay? What are they talking about there, okay? Or what is God talking about there? Our is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, okay? So we see once again the harmony of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit here in creation, in the apex of God's creation, which is man, okay? Man is the only uh, created being who's created in God's image, okay? Dogs weren't created in God's image. Cats weren't created in God's image. Birds or creeping things or any sort of animal or dinosaur in the face of the earth. Only man is created in God's image with the depth of intelligence that is essentially reflecting the image of God, okay? Deep, profound intelligence, human independent will, and with a conscience, the ability to understand good and evil. Also, a complete and complex gamut of emotions and all those attributes together show that man is created in God's image. No other created being or beings or animals or things possess that full gamut of attributes that man possesses, okay? 
Yet once again, we see Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in perfect harmony and collaboration and coordination in creating man. Let us create man in our own image, okay? That's basically Father, Son, and Holy Spirit coming together as one with one accord in the creation of man, okay? So we see the, the unity of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in creation, okay? Now we also see it we also see that harmony and unity in the love between Father, Son, and Holy Spirit and how that love is basically uh, given to man, all right? So here we're going to the Gospel of John. Um, this is Jesus talking at the Last Supper. Jesus answered and said to him, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. He who does not love me does not keep my words, and the word which you hear is not mine but the Father's who sent me. These things I have spoken to you while being present with you, but the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you. John 14, verses 23 to 26. Okay? So if anybody loves Christ, he's going to keep his word. All right? So if you love Christ, you keep his word. And then the Father loves the one who keeps the word of Christ or the believer. Okay? The Father loves the believer because the believer loves Christ, okay? So here we see harmony and unity between Father and Son. And Jesus says, I speak what the Father tells me, okay? Um, these things I have spoken to you, uh, let me back up. Uh, the word which you hear is not mine, but the Father's who sent me, okay? So once again, harmony between Father and Son. The son submits to the father and he just speaks the words that the father tells him, okay? And if the believer keeps the words of the son, he shows that he loves the father and the father in turn will love the believer, okay? And then the father and son will send the Holy Spirit, okay, to indwell the believer, okay? So Jesus says, if you keep my commandments, the father will love you and we will come make our home with you, okay? What does that mean? That means the Holy Spirit will be sent to indwell the one who keeps the word of the Son, okay? Because in keeping the word of the Son, he's keeping the word of the Father. In turn, the Father will love him and send the Holy Spirit. And what is the first and foremost fruit of the Spirit? Love. Okay, love, all right? So the Father is going to send the Spirit. He's going to send the Holy Spirit through the Son, okay? But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you, okay? So the Father is going to send the Holy Spirit in the name of the Son, in the name of the Son, Okay, so once again, we see Father, Son, and Spirit working together in perfect harmony. So the Father's going to send the Spirit, but he's going to send him in the name of the Son. So the Spirit is going to be sent through the Son. Okay, he's going to be sent through the Son. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the Helper, or the Holy Spirit, will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. John 16, 7. Okay, that's later on at the Last Supper. Okay, Jesus says, it's to your advantage that I go away. In other words, I die and pay the sin debt in full, and then I rise from the dead, the dead and I go to the Father. When I go to the Father, I'm going to send the Holy Spirit. I'm going to send the Holy Spirit. And he descended like tongues of fire at Pentecost in Acts 2. Okay, that's what's going to happen. So the Spirit submits to the Son. The Father sends the Spirit in the name of the Son. Okay, therefore, the Son sends the Spirit. Okay, once again, we see that perfect harmony of Father, Son, and Spirit. Okay, so the Father 
sends the Spirit in the name of the Son that it says in those John 14 verses, okay, which means the Son essentially is the one who executes the sending of the Spirit. Jesus says, if I go away, I'll send my Spirit to you, okay? Perfect harmony in this loving relationship between Father, Son, and Spirit and believer and confessing believer, okay? Now, we also see harmony and unity between Father, Son, and Spirit as pertains to truth, as pertains to truth, okay? Now, I'm going to read another verse here from John 16, another couple of verses. When he, the Spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth, for he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will tell you things to come. He will glorify me, for he will take of what is mine and declare it to you. All things that the Father has are mine. Therefore, I said that he will take of mine and declare it to you. John 16, verses 13 to 15, okay? So, we see that the Spirit is essentially the herald of Jesus. He is the voice of Jesus, okay? He is going to declare to the confessing believers what he hears from the Son, He's going to, whatever he hears, he's going to speak, okay? And Jesus says, what all things that the Father has are mine, okay? So Jesus has everything that the Father has, John 10, 30, I and the Father are one. So basically, Jesus is relaying the word from the Father, okay, through the Spirit who speaks on behalf of the Son, okay? So we see, once again, this relationship and this harmony of Father, Son, and Spirit all working together, all working together in perfect unity and perfect collaboration, okay? All the Father has is mine. Jesus speaks what comes from the Father, okay? And that is basically executed through the Holy Spirit who speaks to glorify and magnify the Son. He speaks what he hears from the Son, okay? So we see the Son in submission to the Father and the Spirit in submission to the Son, okay? He speaks what he hears from the Son, okay? He is the Spirit of Christ, the Holy Spirit, okay? Perfect harmony, perfect unity. All right, so we see the submission and the authority, okay? That's how relationships work. When they are in harmony and they are in unity, we see submission and authority. It's the only way relationships can work. You have somebody who's in authority and somebody who submits to that authority, okay? You can't have everybody in authority because then you have nothing but contention and strife. And that's the fallen world we live in. Everybody wants to be the boss. Everybody wants to be God. Uh, God and that's why there's constant strife and enmity. There needs to be submission and authority. And that is demonstrated in the relationship between the Father and the Son. Listen to this from Philippians 2. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bond servant, and coming in the likeness of men, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, and even the death of the cross. Philippians 2, verses 5 to 8. All right, so you have Jesus. He has the same nature as the Father. Once again, John 10, 30, I and the Father are one. And he is on the exact same level, okay, as the Father. But he didn't consider that equality something to be grasped. He humbled himself, okay? He put himself underneath the Father, and he came in the form of a man, okay? So here we have the divinely perfect second member of the Trinity lowering himself to come in the form of sinful flesh, even though he knew no sin. 
he came in the form, nevertheless, of, of fallen flesh, right? And then he humbled himself even further to the point where he was willing to die for all of the sins of all of believing humanity. And he, he suffered the most ignoble death possible. He died on a cross, okay? That's how Romans killed criminals, okay? That was the Roman means of capital punishment. And Jesus was willing to die in that way, okay? In full submission, in the lowly, lowliest form of submission to pay the sin debt in full for all of believing humanity before and after the cross, okay? He was totally willing to humble himself, okay? But obviously, as God, he understands that no relationship can work unless you have submission and authority. So he submitted himself to the Father, even though he is essentially exactly equal with the Father in nature, okay? Listen to this from John 5. I can of myself do nothing. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is righteous because I do not seek my own will, but the will of the Father who sent me, okay? He submits himself to the will of the Father, and his judgment is the Father's judgment, okay? Once again, he's submitting to the authority of the Father. My judgment is righteous because I do not seek my own will but the will of the Father, okay? He has righteous judgment because he's essentially delegating it from the Father. He's submitting himself to the Father. He's submitting himself to the Father, okay? And we've also seen in those previous verses that the Holy Spirit submits to the Son. So once again, we have uh, son submitting to Father and of course the Holy Spirit submitting to the Son and the Father. All right, so we see this relationship between Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It's perfectly harmonious. It's perfectly harmonious in creation, in love, in truth, okay? And it takes the form of submission and authority, and that's why it works. But there's a bigger reason why it works. There's a bigger reason why it works because Father, Son, and Spirit are holy, okay? The Trinity is holy, sinless, pure, whole. I mean, think about the fruits of the Spirit, Galatians 5.22. Love, joy, peace, hope, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, self-control, okay? Father, Son, and Spirit have all of that, all of those attributes in their fullness without any sin at all times, okay? So there's perfect harmony there. There is perfect, perfect, and complete and total harmony. But the Father is holy. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord. Isaiah 6, okay, it's said three times to emphasize the holiness, okay? The Spirit is referred to as holy in the Old Testament and the New Testament 96 times, okay? Jesus is called holy when he's preaching in Capernaum and he exercises the demon. The demon, you know, speaks up and he says, what do we have to do with you, Jesus of Nazareth? Are you going to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Heck, even demons recognize the holiness of the Son. Okay, so that's why this harmony between Father, Son, and Spirit works perfectly because of the holiness, okay? The holiness of the Godhead in all of his forms, Father, Son, and Spirit. Now, we get down to the level of fallen humanity and fallen people, okay? We do not have this harmony. We do not have this unity. We have nothing but contention and strife. And why is that? Because of sin, because of sin, okay? It happened in the garden, thousands of years ago, and obviously it goes on today, and it continues to go from bad to worse. Okay, listen to this. Right after Eve and Adam eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil that they were forbidden to eat from, okay, there's a series of curses that God proclaims, and here's one of them, okay? This is from Genesis 3.16. To the woman, he said, okay, this is Eve, your desire shall be for your husband, 
and he shall rule over you. Genesis 3.16, okay? Right after the fall, okay? There used to be perfect harmony before the fall between husband and wife. Now the battle of the sexes begins. It began in the Garden of Eden, okay? The desire for the woman is for the man. This is not sexual desire. This is the desire of the wife to control the husband, okay? This is the desire of the wife to control the husband. And now the husband, instead of gracefully and compassionately and tenderly leading the wife, now he has to lead the wife by force, okay? What does it say, okay? He shall rule over you, okay? Now the husband has to rule over the wife with authority, okay? And with force, he has to take authority over the wife, okay? This is contention, okay? Now I'm not talking about abuse, but he has to basically exert his authority and his control over the wife because now she's rebellious and she wants to control the husband, okay? This happened back in the garden, okay? Now, the only way this can be rectified, the only way there can be unity between husband and wife, and uh, wife and husband, and there can be harmony between the two, is through God's Holy Spirit, okay? The only way is through salvation and the ministry of the Holy Spirit, because as it says in Isaiah 11:2. One of the attributes of the Holy Spirit is he is the spirit of the fear of the Lord. So the Holy Spirit submits to God, okay? So a husband and wife who are both saved and both have the indwelling Holy Spirit, they will submit to God's design for healthy, holy, harmonious relationships, okay? And Paul provides instructions here about the relationship between the saved husband and the saved wife in the book of Ephesians, okay? Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as also Christ is head of the church, and he is the savior of the body. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be subject, um, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word. Ephesians chapter 5, verses 22 to 26. All right. So God's design is the husband to lead the wife, and the wife is supposed to submit to the husband, is supposed to submit to the husband. At the same time, the husband is supposed to wa uh, love the wife just as Jesus loved the church and gave his life for it. So the husband has got to be willing to completely give his life to the wife to the point where he's willing to die for her. He is her protector, okay? He is her protector, and he is supposed to nurture her in the washing of the word just as Christ washes the church through the word as well, okay? But the wife is supposed to submit to the husband, for the husband is the head of the wife. So this is the way God designed the marital relationship, and this is the way that the healthy and harmonious marital relationship works under the influence of God's Holy Spirit, okay? The wife submits to the husband. The wife respects the husband. The husband gives his wife uh, life to his wife, nurtures her in the word, and protects her, okay? Now, we can go back to Genesis before the fall when God says, Man was not meant to be alone. I will make for him a helper comparable to him, Genesis 2.18. So the wife is not only supposed to submit to the husband, but she is supposed to help the husband, okay? She is supposed to help the husband and comfort the husband. The wife is supposed to get, or the husband is supposed to give his life to his wife and nurture her and wash her in the word and make her or bring her up in the word to present her as pure, okay? So that's the collaborative and holy relationship that God designed for husband and wife 
before the fall, okay? And after the fall, through the regeneration of the Holy Spirit, husband and wife can have this healthy, collaborative, unified, and harmonious relationship. But it's only going to happen if husband and wife are saved and if they're heeding the Word of God, okay? So, now, what about the contention and all the strife and enmity that exists between parents and children? Well, this is also the result of the fall, okay? This is also the result of the fall. Children are not innocent. They do not come out of the womb pure and holy. They come out of the womb rebellious, okay? They come out of the womb liars. They come out of the womb selfish. They come out of the womb contentious. They come out of the womb throwing temper tantrums and crying when they don't get their way, okay? They don't come out of the womb innocent, okay? This is also the result of the fall, okay? We have the contention between parents and children and children and parents. Foolishness is bound up in the heart of a child. The rod of correction will drive it far from him. Proverbs 22, 15, okay? That's what happens. The child comes out of the womb rebellious, selfish, a liar, okay? At odds with his or her parents, all right? That's what happens, okay? Foolishness is bound up in the heart of a child. Well, what is the nature of a fool? A fool is rebellious. A fool despises wi wisdom and instruction. A fool is right in his own eyes, okay? Proverbs 12, 15, Proverbs 18, 2. Okay, that's the way a child is, okay? And the child needs to be corrected, okay? He or she needs to be corrected, the rod of correction. The punishment of the child teaches the child to be obedient and to walk in the proper way. Now, of course, the children are supposed to be nurtured in the Word of God, and the parents are supposed to bring them up in the Word of God so that harmonious relationship that God intended between parents and children can be restored through the influence of the Holy Spirit and through the influence of God's Word, okay? Now, Paul also provides guidance for how children should behave and with respect to their parents. Children, obey your parents and the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with you and you may live long on the earth. And you, fathers, do not provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up in the training and admonition of the Lord. Ephesians 6, verses 1 to 4, okay? So uh, Paul actually goes back to the commandments, okay? Honor your father and mother, okay? Commandment number 5, so your days may be long in the land. It's the only commandment with a promise. So as a general rule of thumb, when children obey their parents, they are blessed with long lives, okay? This isn't the case all the time, but it's a general rule of thumb, okay? So this is right, okay? This is right, and he, Paul basically says it's right because it's in the commandments. It's in the law of God, all right? The first commandment with a promise, all right? And he also says, fathers, don't provoke your children, okay? So it's like the children who, uh, you know, spills milk all over the table at dinner because they're goofing around, and the father scolds and rebukes the son, and then it's over, and then, you know, three hours later, the father is, is still harping on the son for spilling the milk, you know? It's like, that's going too far. That's provoking the child, okay? So the father and the mother, they still have the sin nature and they need to be reminded to not take things too far, all right? You gotta, you gotta, you can't spare the rod. The rod of correction will remove the foolishness from the son or the daughter, but you can't go too far to the point where, you know, the, ch the child feels abused and the child basically retaliates because the parent is going too far, okay? So there's a balance there, and that balance can be maintained through the influence of the Holy Spirit and the Word, and the Word. Okay, so once again, 
through this whole concept of unity, okay, triune unity, and how we can have unity and harmony in our relationships, all relationships, but I highlighted the relationships of husband, husbands and wives and parents and children. The way this harmony is going to happen is through the influence of the Holy Spirit, uh, obedience to the word and maintaining this relationship of submission and authority submission and authority okay that's exemplified between father son and spirit okay and when it works properly between father um, husbands and wives and children and parents there is submission and authority okay and paul hits this on the head in first corinthians 11. but i want you to know that the head of every man is christ the head of woman is man and the head of christ is god 1 Corinthians 11.3, okay? Submission and authority, submission and authority. The head of man is Christ. The head of Christ is God. The head of woman is man, okay? When you have those relationships, then you have an opportunity for harmony, for unity, for the fullness of these relationships to glorify God and to be rich and rewarding and nurturing for all parties involved, okay? Once you take away the submission and the authority aspect, you have nothing but contention, okay? Judges 21, 25, in those days there was no king and everybody did what was right in his own eyes, okay? This is nothing new. What happened in the time of Judges? Nothing but contention and strife and evil and sin that became so bad that God had to take have his people taken into captivity over and over and over again by their enemies and then ultimately they would cry out to God for mercy and he would appoint, uh, appoint a judge to deliver them because he had pity on them but Nevertheless, everybody does what's right in their own eyes. Everybody thinks that they're going to be the boss and they're going to play God. Then you have nothing but contention and strife and enmity. And that's what happens in the world without God. That's why there's so much trouble. That's why there's so much enmity. That's why parents and children are at odds and at war with each other. That's why husbands and wives are at odds with each other. That's why no marriage it seems like very, very few, if any, marriages can last in this day and age because the husband basically has to rule over the wife because the wife is trying to control the husband, okay? That's what happens without God. That's what happens without his Holy Spirit. That's what happens when we don't come under the guidance of the Spirit through the Word of God, okay? To be unified, to be one, we need to be saved, okay, to have harmonious relationships like Father, Son, and Spirit. We need to be saved. We need to have God's indwelling Holy Spirit, and we need to submit to his guidance through the Word of God. Only then can we be one, okay? Only then can we have these whole and harmonious relationships, Holy Father, keep through your name those whom you have given to me, that they may be one as we are. John 17, 11. Okay, that can only happen through the influence, through the regeneration of the Holy Spirit. Okay, and nobody can be regenerated through the Holy Spirit unless they confess Christ as Lord as the one and only acceptable sacrifice and payment for his or her sins. All have sinned and all fall short of God's glory. Romans 3.23, Romans 6.23, the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Romans 3.10, there's not one righteous, not one, not one who understands or seeks after God, okay? Every human being on the planet is a rebel, is a rebel against God, okay? Basically, essentially doing whatever is right in their own eyes. They do not submit to the law of God, nor can they submit, okay? Romans 8.7, their minds are dead in trespasses, 
and sin, Ephesians 2, 1, okay? That's the nature of the unregenerate person. He or she is a rebel against God. He or she does whatever is right in his or her eyes, okay? There's not one righteous, not one, okay? And the only way that we can come into this harmonious relationship with Father, Son, and Spirit, the only way we can be empowered to have harmonious relationships in our lives on this earth is to confess Christ as Lord because he paid the sin debt in full, okay? He paid the sin debt in full. For our sake he made the man who knew no sin to become sin for us. So in him we might become the righteousness of God. 2 Corinthians 5.21, okay? Jesus pays the sin debt in full for all of believing humanity before and after the cross who confess him as Lord. And when the Holy Father of the universe looks at the confessing sinner, he sees his perfect son who paid the sin debt in full, okay? Isaiah 53.5, he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The penalty for our peace was, was upon him and by his wounds we are healed okay so all the lying cheating stealing lusting that we've all done and we all will do from cradle to grave essentially when we confess christ as lord all those sins get thrown on his shoulders at the cross okay and he's crushed by the father for those sins and then what happens is god sees the confessor as holy and pure because he sees his son. Romans 10, 9, if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, believe in your heart, God raised him from the dead, then you will be saved, okay? Then you will go from darkness to light. You will go from hell to heaven. You will go from lies to truth. You will go from flesh to spirit, okay? Titus 3, 5 says, he saved us, not because of our righteous deeds or our righteous works, but because of his mercy and because of the washing and regeneration of the Holy Spirit. So whenever you confess Christ as Lord, not only are you saved, but you are regenerated by his Holy Spirit from the inside out. And this allows you to not only have all of the fruits of the Spirit in your life, love, joy, peace, hope, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, self-control, but this allows you to have harmonious and whole relationships with everybody in your, in your life, with children, with spouses, with friends, with everybody you know because the first and foremost attribute of the Spirit's fruit is love, and you have this ability to love, okay? And this comes from God. Without God in your heart, you cannot love. You can only do what feels good to you, looks good to you, and puffs up your pride. You can't love. You may say you love somebody, but what you really love is what somebody else does, does for you. This kind of love, agape love, is about what you do for others selflessly. And this allows you to have whole, unified, healthy relationships. This allows you to submit or be in authority underneath God. This allows you to have the type of harmonious relationship that exists between Father son and holy spirit okay now it's never going to be the perfect harmonious relationship between father son and spirit this side of heaven because father son and spirit are holy and the believer is fallen nevertheless with the indwelling holy spirit the believer can have this kind of harmonious and healthy and growing and nurturing relationship with his or her spouse, children, and friends. So once again, the series is called Straight Scripture, No Sugar, a Bible sermon series dedicated exclusively to the Word of God. I pray this is a great source of edification for the believer and evangelism for the unbeliever. 
can watch any of these sermons online through the URL getbibletruth.com. I say thank you so much for listening. My name is John Parisi. God bless you. Amen.